All organisms that lived during the Ediacaran time period lived in the oceans. There was no life on land at this time, except maybe for some bacteria. So when we look at the Ediacaran organisms, we can look at their shape and their size and determine that they probably lived on the seafloor as opposed to up in the water column swimming around like a fish. In Australia, the rocks that the Ediacaran fossils are found in are often rippled. Those ripples were formed hundreds of millions of years ago, the same way they are formed today in modern oceans, which is by the action of moving water. Usually in the ocean, that moving water is due to tides coming in and out. So we can look at those ripples in the rocks and decide that that water was probably pretty shallow, maybe 50 to 100 meters deep, because when you get into even deeper, deeper water than that, tides and the moving water can't affect the very bottom of the ocean, only affects the top part. So based on that sedimentological information, we can determine that the Ediacaran fauna, the organisms that lived in the Ediacaran in Australia, lived in relatively shallow waters. In other parts of the world where Ediacaran fossils are found, they are found in rocks that are not rippled. And these rocks are very different than the Australian rocks. And they look like they were deposited in much deeper water, perhaps even up to hundreds of meters deep. What were these animals, plants, whatever they were, what were they doing on the seafloor? In the case of this material from the Flinders Ranges, we've got good evidence that this is relatively shallow water. In other words, light could penetrate to the seafloor. And so it would be possible, for instance, that some of these things might actually be marine algae. Others may be animal-like creatures and others may be groups that are completely extinct, of which we have no modern representatives. That's the dilemma. So first of all, we have to ask, if these were animals, what were they feeding on? And the clue comes from looking at these surfaces. Now, forgetting the stains on the rocks, which were really just a product of the, of the place where the rock was found. Um, when you look at the texture of the rocks, you find that once you get away from the fossils and their feeding traces, there are lots of little knobs and grooves and rods and pucker marks, which is really quite rare on the bottom of sandstone layers in, in younger rocks. So it looks as though these layers of sand cascaded down from shallow water into, onto seafloor bottoms that had been quiet for a long time and where lots of dead organisms had probably gathered and where there were colonies of microbes growing on the seafloor, perhaps decomposing those dead organisms, perhaps because they were in relatively shallow seawater they were using sunlight uh, and photosynthesis to actually reproduce and to uh, use the nutrients that they got from the seafloor. So this was a kind of a, a world of slime and very few animals were around to actually make use of that. Today we see that, but there are so many creatures in shallow seas today which are crawling around on the seafloor, uh, eating the sand, digesting that organic material, that it's very rare that you see a slimy layer over the seafloor. But it happens. If you kill all the animals on all the plants in any environment, whether it be your aquarium, or whether it be the pond in your backyard, or whether or in an, uh, a lake, or in a river, or even in the ocean, all of a sudden you see slime grows again. Microorganisms colonize the seafloor, they colonize rocks. And it's one of the hallmarks of a very dangerous pollution that the bacteria and microorganisms take over just like they did for all those billions of years before the Ediacaran. So the Ediacaran is the time of the interface between the world of slime and the world where animals appear to dominate.